All right, Jerry, it's time for your top ten okay. list. Okay, you're going to cut me off at ten, right? You're going to eat because you know how to count, right, in the English language? James? Yeah. You yeah. do know how to do that. Good. Okay. Um, you know, I didn't get to talk about this guy because I forgot to mention him on the uh, sh- the other show that I do. Wong Kar Wai, hmm. number ten, for In the Mood for Love, 2046. He did one of the films in Eros. And he did his American debut, My Blueberry Nights, which, if anyone's keeping track at home, has Rachel Weisz and Natalie Portman, and you can shut the hell up after that. Um, I, can, I like that movie. I like that that's movie. That's a good Very movie. Much. Isn't that a good movie? Yeah, it is. That's an awesome movie. But uh, In the Mood for Love is really the one that I'm talking about in as far as this decade goes, but it's very important to know that um, – Whatever the company was that owns the rights to his films released the older films of his. I had watched in the last decade, like a lot of people, I'd watched Chunking Express that um, Quentin Tarantino gives the introduction on beforehand. And that's a very good movie. And I watched Happy Together, but there wasn't. it was hard to watch a lot of his films because they weren't available. And then Days of Being Wild and all these other films became available in this decade. And I fell in love with him. And he's a, he makes beautiful films. And in the he mood does. For love, in the mood for love is one of the most is one of two films that I've seen in the first half of this decade that really cinematically describe what love is, and it's it's it's, it's an incredible film, and and just he's he just evokes this old Hollywood charm and, and glamour that I haven't seen from a lot of other people, mm-hmm. so he he has to be mentioned. He's incredible. Well, I, you know, I am ashamed to say, I have seen 2046, and I loved it. I did see my Blueberry Nights, and I loved it. I haven't seen In the Mood for Love, <laughs> which is the masterpiece. We're not, we're not, um, it's not a, it's not a contest, it's not a race, that's cool. I mean, I hope you can No, I, I'm personally ashamed, because I, I very much have wanted to see it. it it's, no, it's his a, it's masterpiece. Really, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a beautiful film. I saw it. I, I left work one day early to go see it, and I remember a guy fell asleep, um, while you know near me, and they just snoring, and his girlfriend was like, "Oh, don't wake him up! He works all the time. Please don't wake him up." But it's a it's a beautiful film. I mean, he, and his I think the cinematographer he likes to use a lot, Chris Doyle, who, who has just a great eye for everything, and he's done a right. lot of um, right. wonderful films, and, and he just has a great eye. I mean, they're just wonderful films. Well, and the, and his eye is what I like about Lady in the Water. When I talk about how well shot Lady in the Water is, mm-hmm. it's Chris Doyle. Oh yeah, I don't deny, dude. I don't deny. I'm not going to deny you there. I mean, you're right. You're absolutely right. Uh, and uh, okay, so just to just to bring everyone up to speed, we've gone through the top ten of the decade with Chris. Now we're going through uh, ten directors of distinction from the past decade with Jerry. Okay, your next your next choice, Jerry. And this is going to piss you off, Jamie, like you've never been <laughs> off before. Jody Hill, The Foot Fist Way, and Observe and Report. Okay. Yeah. Um, I watched The Foot Fist Way again today because I knew that I would cause trouble later on. Um, and Observe and Report is not the obvious choice you would, you know, I, we, I know, you, Jamie, you don't like it, and that's not why I picked it because you didn't like it, but it left a distinct mark on me. But while doing the other show that I do with Aunt Francis, um, Paul Bassetti had brought up, it reminded him a lot of Punch Drunk Love. And that's the, the most intelligent analogy I've heard about the film, the comparing Adam Sandler's Barry Egan to um, Seth Rogen's character in the film. But that's, that's beside the point. Jody Hill is a sick son of a bitch. And if you watch the Foot This Way and Observe and Report, this guy has – just a great comic timing. He works with Danny McBride, obviously, in the first film, and then works with Seth Rogen. But he has a way of getting out these really dark, perverted performances, but actually making a really good film in the process. And I think he's a talent to watch in the next decade. I don't, I don't think he has anything lined up off the bat. I was doing some research earlier. But these two films um, are great um, character studies. Um, besides being insanely funny, um, in the Observer, in the Observer Reports case, um, I, I like to throw in the fact that there are two other black comedies, um, World's Greatest Dad and mm. The Big Fan, which I finally watched yesterday. And mm. while I like those films, I still think Observer and Report is just so disturbing in, in, in many facets that it works. So Jody Hill was my number nine. Black comedy is, t- is tough. Oh, it's, uh, dude, it's impossible. Yeah. 
try yeah. watching Big Fan with my dad, okay? Well, it's, watching... it's, it's obviously got to be very dark and disturbing, and yet it has to deliver the laughs mm-hmm. on some level. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so it's a it's a delicate. I know balance. you did not like Observer Report. Um, you had a lot of problems with it. I I, I didn't like Observer Report, but uh, because it was missing the laughs for me. But no, uh, it, it, I'm not, I can see I'm that. Not familiar with Joe, I'm not familiar with Jody Hill, I, uh, really career wise. So I can't say one way or another. But it, it means something to you. That's why it's on. Oh, the it list. means it means, dude. I just cut me off when we get to 10 cuz I don't know how to count, okay? Just Okay, so your next your next choice. <laughs> Ryan Johnson, Brick and the Brothers Bloom. I have watched both of these films again in the last month. Um I don't know what Looper his third film promises to be, but watching Brick um last in December again when Joseph Gordon-Levitt and his co-stars recite that language when they incorporate um, Johnson's words, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's a linguistic ecstasy that I haven't only heard one other time this decade. Um, Watching the Brothers Bloom again last night, I don't know. know, I wish that Inglorious Bastards and um, uh, the other two films, um, 500 Days of Summer and Ventureland, hadn't come out this year. It would make it a lot easier to choose for a best picture because the Brothers Bloom is um, on fire. Um, I've never seen all four of those actors. There's a girl from Babel, but there's Adrian Brody, Mark Ruffalo, and especially Rachel Wise. They're on fire on that film. That movie was not given a chance, and I don't, I'm not sure why. But, but doesn't it seem that style. it wasn't given a chance? No, it wasn't given a chance at all. But he has a style. He has a style, I think, that Wes Anderson and Spike Jones has. And I just I hope that I, I'm allowed that privilege to watch it evolve. Over the, this decade, yeah. Uh, your next choice, my and Chris. Next... Any anytime you want to chime in about these movies, go yeah, ar- please, ar- please interrupt me. You know, like n- kick me in the nuts, please. No, uh, I'm listening. I, I'd be. I'm like Jamie. I didn't have too much to add to Wong Kar Wai, Jody Hill. I'm sort of. Uh, I like to put fist way, but uh, I can't say I like to observe and report. I do think he's somebody to watch, and I mm-hmm. think the same thing more, even more so about uh, Ryan Johnson. I loved Brick, and mm-hmm. I liked uh, Brothers Bloom. I think he's got a lot of range, and I think actually he's got a lot of versatility. So I agree. Let me, ask you, watch. let me ask you this, Chris, before we go into my next choice. Do you think, though, he in those two films, I know two films, it's hard to get a sense of style, but I do get a That's what I got while watching the Brothers Bloom in the theater. Like a Wes Anderson, like a Spike Jones, he does have a style. There's something he's very smart, very a very oh, yeah. literate, like Wes Anderson. Very yeah. literate. Anytime, anytime a director can make two movies that both have his distinctive scent on them, mm-hmm. then in my opinion, he's someone to watch. Okay, uh, and that's very true of him. Distinctive scent is rubbed all over those movies. Okay, it's cool. The next choice we're going to go with Noah Baumbach. Ah. And the reason I'm going to do this is because in the 90s we got Kicking and Screaming and Mr. Jealousy, two yeah. wonderful films with Chris Eigman and just two wonderful films about 20-somethings. And then he disappeared. And he disappeared. And then he made two films that are so hard and so painful to watch, The Squid mm. and the Whale, Margaret the Wedding, that leads me to think that um, he's making films for the true films of Generation X. Um, the Squid and the Whale is the most honest film I've seen about what it's like to be the child of, of divorce. And I know yeah. you you could say, oh, well, what about E.T.? No, E.T. is definitely an, an honest film about what it's like to be the child of divorce. But, uh, but, for, our, but for, that ge- for our generation to make that film, or my, my generation to make that film, it's very important. Margot at the wedding? Holy shit. Nicole yeah. Kidman? She's the yeah. most vicious... I'm sorry. She she makes Summer Finn look like a Girl Scout. Um, she's just evil in that film. But yeah. what I like about him is he's very honest. He doesn't hold back. He lets you know what he's um. He lets you know, hey, you know, we're, these aren't likable characters. Um, but I'm going to present them in a way. But what I like about a Squid and the Whale is. You know, I talk to some people, they think it's very funny, and then there are other people who, who have lived through that experience. It's a very depressing, very hard film to watch. My brother walked out of the room. He couldn't watch yeah. it. He, and 
I t- and when I watched Margo at the wedding in the theater, um, several people walked out within the first half hour. Yeah, I, I love that. I love this choice, Jerry. And I think Noah Baumbach actually has a lot in common with Woody Allen. And I think he uh, his his two movies from the '90s, as well as his two movies from this decade, yeah, uh, are very similar to the kind of movies that Woody Woody Allen's making, uh, and especially the two from this decade, Marco Margo at the Wedding and Squid in the Whale, insanely good movies. Mm-hmm. Both uh, illustrate perfectly and beautifully how nasty and painful and hurtful uh, the people, uh, more than anyone, the people that that you love can be to you. Uh, mm-hmm. No one can no one can hurt you more. Both those right. movies, uh, especially Squid and the Whale, illustrate that so well. Mm-hmm. Uh, unlike unlike anything I'd seen before, actually. Yeah, no, I mean, Margaret's Wedding, like, my mom was supposed to go see that with me, and when I got home, I told her, you would have walked out. Yeah. I said, you would have walked out within the first 20 minutes. Because, I mean, I, it, it's a very hard movie to watch. And you're right about Nicole Kidman. Nicole Kidman, for a time there, threatened to be the female Nicolas Cage. She was just doing so yeah. much that it was a good reminder of of her gifts. That mm-hmm. movie. Uh, your next one, Sofia Coppola. Exactly. Yeah, of course. You knew that was coming. You all knew that was coming because if you were watching what I was watching yesterday, I watched Marie Antoinette last night. Um, but it's the Virgin Suicides. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's what she has with Kirsten Dunst, um, using her as her surrogate almost in that movie and Marie Antoinette. Not to say I don't I love Lost in Translation, but I think the thing about Sofia Coppola that's very interesting is the Virgin Suicides comes under the radar. A lot of people have written her off from The Godfather Three, which I had no problem with her performance, but what do I know? Um and the Virgin Suicides is the most accurate depiction I've seen of the seventies at that point. I'm just saying at that point, um, and the gentleman who does the cinematography, and I don't have the name at the top of my head right now, it's a beautiful film. It reminds me of what it was like to grow up during that time. But she really hit on something there in that book. I went home after I watched, I went to a special screening of the film. I went home, um, bought the book, read it the next day, and I was just blown away by everything that that movie and book had to offer. And then there's Lost in Translation. And then several years later, there's Marie Antoinette. She's a very personal filmmaker, and she identifies yeah. very strongly with each subject. And she identifies with Marie Antoinette in the sense that she grew up in the court of Francis Ford Coppola. And that's really what that film is about, growing up in I, the... I think Marie Antoinette is actually uh, her most underrated movie. Like more, it's even a more great so, film. Even more so than The Virgin Suicide. It's like yeah. a really, really good movie, mm-hmm. and really sort of written off as not as good as Lost in Translation. I disagree. could not disagree more. Uh, There's a very personal independence of spirit that mm-hmm. Sofia Coppola has right at the outset of her career, and, and you can't help but make the parallels yeah. between her and her father. Yeah. She inherited a lot. Uh, your, your next choice, which would be I, number five. Number five, thank you. I'm glad someone's, someone knows how to count. You guys are great. You know how to count. I don't, unfortunately. That might explain my failure in high school math. But um, my next choice is Greg, um, and you'll forgive me if I mispronounce his last name, Greg Matola, who made Adventureland. Matola, yeah. Matola, I'm sorry. Matola. And he also made Superbad. And in the previous decade, he made The Day Trippers. Um, I like Superbad. I think it's very funny. I think you could take it out of the equation, and he's made two really awesome films, The Day Trippers and Adventureland. Adventureland is one of the finest coming-of-age movies I've seen in a long time. Um, it hits very close to home. It's perfect. It captures the 80s very well. But it's the day trippers. I, I know it wasn't in this decade, but I keep referencing the day, day trippers every week. Um, maybe it's the Liv Scribner character because he makes a jackass out of himself, and I think of him a lot. But um, that's a great film. But Adventureland, I don't think I've ever seen a better coming-of-age film. It's amazing the kind of reaction that some people had to Adventureland. And I won't say that I didn't like the movie, but there's a certain group of people, and you're among them, who had the kind of reaction to this movie that leads me to believe that it will only become more of a cult classic as time goes on, and I will learn to appreciate it more. I liked the movie, but more than liking the movie, I think it's important to recognize that there's a group of people, again, you included, Mm -hmm. who had this very visceral reaction to that movie, and that accounts for something. Okay. Uh, so uh, it's a, Let it's me add something to that. Um, 
I, when we went to go see it the Friday it came out, the sound died at the most crucial point of the film. I went back the next day to see it again. I was not bored at all to the point where I wanted to make to see, and I missed, you know, if you had, there are a lot of people who would who didn't know, wow, that's the most important part of the movie. I mean, we're in this five minutes where the sound died. I went back, and but even up to that point, I was like, my God, this, I like this film even more the second time. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's just a really powerful film. You know what impresses me about it too, and I've said this about another movie recently, and I can't remember which one. But in dealing with the '80s decade, it's not obvious. I mean, there are obvious ways that you can you can portray a decade, or the movie can just exist in that decade. You don't Very have to draw authentic. draw attention to it. Yeah, that that was impressive to me. Yeah. Uh, your next choice, Jerry. Number four. Sure. <laughs> Is it number four? I, yeah, I'm, number four. Or you're fooling with me. I feel like the blind man who goes to the library. Um, no, Todd Field. Mm. Um, mm. Todd Field is a very important choice. Um, I like his first film, this actor. He directed in the bedroom, but nothing can compare to Little Children. I was not looking forward to Little Children before I saw it because I, I thought the trailer was mediocre at best. It felt like something we'd seen before. Yeah, the, tra and, the trailer did. Yeah, the trailer is it's a it's a really bad trailer. Um, yeah. with the with the train with the train sounds in the background, and everything it's just like what is this? As it's like we saw lights, American Beauty. Yeah. Um, as soon as the lights go down, as soon as the credits start, and we're in, and introduced to that playground sequence, I refused to get out of my seat. I could. I was just totally wrapped up in what Kate Winslet. Patrick Wilson, Jennifer Connelly, um, Jack or Hurley, everyone was just so engrossing. But I will say this right now. Never before has an, act, an actress deserved an Academy Award than for Kate Winslet for the book club sequence. When she mm -hmm. makes that yeah. thing about Madame Bovary, and it's yeah. not just that scene, but it's also this, the dinner scene when they're all together with Jennifer Connelly and everything, where you see how far she's lost it, it's just incredible. I, I, I don't remember being that wrapped up in the film before that for a long time that I wasn't looking forward to. I really wasn't looking forward to the film. It was just one of the things you want to get out of the way, and I just got so sucked into it. Yeah. It's um, a great movie, and the uniqueness of the narration, uh, too, the voiceover narration, uh, impressed me. And the journey of the characters in the movie, brave enough to say, uh, can you dare to sympathize with a child molester? And I thought that that's one of the true. Most, that's very true. One of the most sympathetic characters in that movie is Jackie Earl Haley's mother, mm -hmm. and oh I just felt like breaking down every time she was so desperately trying to defend her son. Mm -hmm. uh, that that's the most emotional part of that movie for me. You're I right. In in my opinion, Little Children suffers from what I would call casino syndrome, which is to say. Just like Casino came out after Goodfellas, but if Casino had come out first, I think we would remember Casino as the better movie, and some of us do. But I think that Little Children has that problem with American Beauty. Oh, to say you're that. right. If Little if Little Children had come out first, and American Beauty had come out five years later, uh, American Beauty would have been nominated for a bunch of shit, but not mm -hmm. one. Whereas five years previous, Little Children probably would have won Best Picture. Mm -hmm. They deal with very right similar, right. very similar themes. Uh, in fact, almost identical themes. Uh, but the execution, once again, with little children is far greater uh, than uh, American Beauty. Uh, much more memorable movie, much more haunting mm -hmm. and a rich movie. Yeah. Well, I just a, a little footnote. I, I spoke to Todd Field briefly. Yeah. Yeah, I waited <laughs> for him to be back on with his new movie. It, it's an interesting story. But he, he's got an untitled movie that's being kept under wraps, but I think he's working on it now. And uh, he promised us he'd, he'd come see us when the uh, when the movie comes out. So we we may have a chance to drill him about little children, uh, so to speak. Your next yeah. choice. Your next choice, Jerry. Number three, John Hillcoat, The Proposition and the Road. Um, the Proposition. I have talked too much about it on this show and on the other show, but it's it's magnificent. Um, it, it, enough can't be said about it. But I've never talked about the road on this show because it's a very hard film to talk about. And never before has an, a director and an author been 
meant to be together as John Hilko and um, Cormac McCarthy. They're perfect. Hmm. And I know a lot of people are saying, oh, well, Jerry, you want to like a road. And a lot of people don't like the road because it's bleak. Well, it's a movie about the end of the world. What did you expect? Mary fucking Poppins? I mean, it's the end of the world. It's doomsday. I mean, it's every sense. It's, it's the worst possible scenario you can expect. But John Hillcoat is perfectly suited for this, given his Western the proposition, which in many ways is um, Heart of Darkness set in the uh, outback in the, colon- in the um, colonial area in Australia. But I just think John Hillcoat, the world is, he can do whatever he wants. And I, I, I wish he would have done all the pretty horses. I wish he'd do all the Cormac McCarthy's books. Cause uh, he Blood has, Meridian, please. Uh, well, is, I think Todd Field is attached to Blood Meridian. Is that right? Oh. I think. I'm not positive about that. Don't quote me. Oh, God, I can see people are going to quote me on this. But um, don't quote me uh, on Hill, that. Hillcoat, Hillcoat would do wonders with it. So. Yeah, I mean, but I'm watching The Road. And it's a very good movie, and it's a movie that should be, you know, people are making, and I like the Book of Eli a lot, and I, I would hope that people would talk about both of them, compare them up, because they're both worthy of comparison and how they treat, in the different ways they treat the subject matter of the end of the world. But Hillcoat just has this unique vision of the West, and the post-apocalyptic is the West as well, as Manola Dar just pointed out in her review of the Book of Eli, but he just has this unique vision, and it's so intoxicating to watch. Um, I, I really, even if he just made the proposition, if that was the only film he made, I would, I would say this film is incredible. I mean, I've never seen anything like that. Um, it's just yeah. a wonderful film. And, and really a movie where Danny Houston comes alive, which I did, oh. which, yeah. He earns and, his last name. In that movie, he does, and I, I've never, I've never been one to be taken by him, but I sure was in that movie. The proposition. Yeah. Uh, your next, your next choice, which would be your number two. My number two is going to make all of you just groan. Richard Kelly. Mm. <laughs> oh, 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 come on, Chris. You, you know you hate me for that. You hate me for no. that choice. No, I wasn't. That that noise was not for Richard Kelly himself. That noise was in reaction to you saying that I would groan. Uh, because I think he fits very well into this list of yours, because really this list has been about uh, essentially the rookies. Like, this is uh, the guys... Thank you. I not love you for this. Not necessarily the cream of the crop. These are the guys that we need to keep an eye on, because these are the guys that are going to be the next, uh, you know, the next... There's sort of three classes right now, right now working. You've got the yeah. guys like Eastwood and Spielberg and Scorsese. Then you've got, you know, the... The juniors, you've got the Wes Andersons and the Paul Thomas Andersons mm-hmm. and the Quentin Tarantinos. You and know, then all these, guys these I the, love, you know, that I work no, with. No, and I do too, but this list of yours, from what I can tell so far, for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part, is the freshman. Yeah. Uh, and, and I like it, and I think that he deserves to be on that list. Okay, can I tell why he's on this list? Because I wrote a review of the box that will be on my tombstone, that I'll be the guy that like defended Richard Kelly till the end. But um, I want to say what brought me to this defense of Richard Kelly. And while I love Southland Tales, and I do like The Box a lot, and I adore Donnie Darko, when The Box came out in the first weekend of November of 2009, I Twitter, that be-all, end-all of um, film criticism, I guess now, people were condemning The Box to, and Richard Kelly for that matter, to death. And when I finally saw someone write The Fourth Kind is a better movie, which I had seen, I was like, i got to come to this man's defense. There's no way that you could think The Fourth Kind is a better movie. I don't care who you are. Um, you need to defend the box. I, we always complain with, in the summer blockbusters that there's a deficit of creativity. And, and you know, when you look at something like G.I. Joe or Transformers, that's an easy case to make. There's just it's really they're bland films. They're big, they're explosions. But do you remember anything about those films? No, no. I mean, and Chris, you're right to condemn me for liking the first Transformers. It's fun, but it, it's a bad <laughs> film. It's a it's a piece of shit. It's crap. Um, you're and then you're absolutely right in your what you said about that film. Um, our first summer on the air. 
Um, when I look at someone like Richard Kelly, I see someone who's so creative, has so many ideas. He just doesn't have someone to help him funnel those ideas mm-hmm. into a mm-hmm. cohesive screenplay. It's not to say he makes bad films. He makes very interesting films. He makes films that I'll remember, but he does need someone to help him out. But he is yeah. such a creative vision. He he is obsessed yeah. with – he's obs- all right, if John Hillcoat and the, and the Hughes brothers are obsessed with what happens after the end of the world, he's obsessed with what happens before. There's a lot of anxiety yeah. he's about what happens before the world ends. I'll say yeah. one thing for him, and I like him. I, I like Donnie Darko. I even like Southland Tales more than most people. But uh, uh, he's not lazy. No one is going to be accusing this guy of being a lazy filmmaker. Does not take the easy choices. No, he does doesn't. Does not take the easy way out. He's interested in making singular movies uh, that have his vision. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I like that. I, I mean, I, I feel like, uh, you know, I mean, this, again, he's, he's one of the freshmen. He's one of the guys to keep an eye on. I think that in this list, uh, part of what Chris has been saying, too, about it. It's true. It, it's not just for the past decade. It's it's looking ahead and looking forward to where these filmmakers go in the next decade. I hope that Richard Kelly gets a chance to continue on his path, because he hasn't been getting a lot of studio support. No, he hasn't gotten studio support. He got, the, the you know, it's not just Twitter, but it's also that Entertainment Weekly issue that came out after the film was, the box was released. There were three articles with it was the box office list it was a little article about the box and it was a review of the box it just said his his career was over mm-hmm. and it really pissed me off no that's that's just someone who doesn't like him uh writing that article i guarantee you well he himself said it he himself said i'm afraid that my career will be over mm-hmm. if the he box did say that out. and then he went to go see a christmas carol for the sixth time that weekend um Okay, so your number your your last choice, which you is number one. You know the last choice. I'm gonna. I'm, this is not a surprise to anyone. David Gordon Green. Yes. Mm. Okay, fits that was a good. Fits so perfectly on this list too. Yeah, thank you, and I'm so glad that, that this actually has some it has a motif. <laughs> list. As I was thinking about that yesterday, <laughs> does this have a motif? Um, and it does. And Chris, I really appreciate you. Don't know how much I appreciate you for bringing that out. But David Gordon Green. Who I've gone back. We watched Undertow um, last week. Uh, All the real girls. I haven't gone back to watch George Washington recently, and I haven't gone back to watch Snow Angels because I don't have a clean razor blade with me to watch it with because it's a depressing film. But I think he's some. The next decade belongs to him. I'm not. I'm not just saying. I know, I don't know about Your Highness. I have a big question mark about Your Highness because it it. Pineapple Express, while I think is a very funny movie and everything, the criticism against it is the tonal shift in the third act. It goes from the right. stoner comedy to this like action, like 48 hours and midnight run. Your Highness has, I think, a big benefit to it. It's a spoof of all these movies, and if that's what the tone is, I don't know what the tone is yet, but you have Robin Hood with Russell Crowe coming out. You have Clash of the Titans coming out with, um, in the March. And it could be the perfect thing to spoof these films, if that's what it is. Um, I don't know. And it's not the film that he's following this up with is not a, any easier. It's Suspiria, Dar- Dario Argento's film, a classic film, and it's a remake. And he's never done a horror film before. But I think that because he's proven himself in these unknown territories that he can do it, I think he might be able to do that. And I just think he's someone to watch out for because he hasn't let me down yet in five films. No. He is. If I were, if you, were, if I were an odds maker, if I were Ace Rothstein, and I were betting on who you know, a director who has never uh, been nominated for an Oscar who will one day win an Oscar, he would be my number one choice. He's the one guy who it seems like it's it's absolutely a fait accompli. This guy will one day make a film that will capture the entire uh, country's imagination, if not the world. Like he just feels like that kind of filmmaker. Right. Uh, he's going to make something someday that's really important. And that's not to say that uh, his other movies have not been important. In fact, I think All the Real Girls in particular is the one that needs that people will remember as kind of his McCabe and Mrs. Miller. Like, no one really knows about it now. No one paid attention. But mm-hmm. in years to come, that movie will be looked at and remembered. Like, it's a right, really, I agree. really well-made movie. 
uh, and Snow Angels also in particular. I think so, Snow Angels is great. It's just so depressing. But if you, I don't know how that movie disappeared. I don't know how that movie got buried in the snow, as it were. Uh, a really, really strong movie from last year. And it's a great performance from Rockwell. Just a oh my God. powerful, yeah. just powerhouse yeah. performance from him and Kate Beckinsale too. Yeah, great list. Jerry's top ten directors of distinction for the decade: Juan Car Wai, Jody Hill. Ryan Johnson, Noah Bombeck, Sophia Coppola, Greg Matola, Todd Field, John Hillcoat, Richard Kelly, and David Gordon Green. You're going to hear a lot about these people in the next decade, so you better study up and watch their previous films. <laughs> you can come over to my house and watch the films. <laughs> exactly. It's an open invitation from Jerry. So. <laughs> yeah, no, really. Put your address in the chat room, Jerry. Go ahead. <laughs> <All right. laughs> 